geeks and geekettes all around the world, welcome to another edition of Ask Chuck Dixon, where I share with you over three decades of my experiences and knowledge and trials and tribulations of being a comic book creator, specifically a comic book writer. Uh, yep. It's time once again for you to ask questions of your old comic book pal and four-color <laughs> comics historian, Chuck Dixon. So let's get to the first question. Dystronium, how do you prevent your work from becoming derivative of other work? How do you recognize that this is happening? What techniques do you use to prevent this? Um, you know, way back when I was a young spud out of high school and went to community college, um, frankly, I, I went to community college simply so I could stay on my dad's insurance because I needed my wisdom teeth taking out, taken out. And a semester of community college was a lot cheaper than paying out of pocket for uh, <laughs> dental surgery. <laughs> but one of the courses I took, and I, I stopped by every once in a while, see what was going on. And I took an English composition course. And one of the assignments was to write a short story. And so I wrote a short story, which actually became quite long. Uh, I imagine it would be a novella. It was all handwritten because I couldn't type. Still can't. Um, I, I hunt and peck, by the way, uh, much like Stephen King does. He's done okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, the assignment was to write a, uh, a, a story just made up out of our minds. And so I wrote this story about this, this mountain man far up in the Canadian wilderness, right? And he runs into a polar bear, which he'd never seen before. Uh, and the polar bear kills somebody he cares about. I can't remember the whole story, but kills somebody he cares about. And he makes it his mission. He's going to hunt that bear even into the ends of the earth. And so he gathers up some of his pals and a couple of uh, Indian guides. And he goes further and further north in search of this uh, terrible creature. And I was pretty proud of it and uh, handed it into the teacher and you know, a week later, you know, next class, he comes back and he hands everybody back their grades, but he asked me to stay after class. Something I was, you know, used to in high school. <laughs> so um, he says he really liked the story. He thought it was well written, but th did I intentionally write a pastiche of Moby Dick? <laughs> That's when I realized, yeah, I unconsciously stole the plot to one of the greatest American novels of all time. And from that moment on, it taught me a lesson. You know, be careful of where your thoughts come from. If you're writing a story and it's it doesn't seem to be fresh, it seems more familiar than new, you're probably copying somebody unconsciously. So that's why a writer, as I've often said on these videos, always has to ask themselves, is there a better way to say this? And basically that makes you search your mind for alternatives. And sometimes when you do that, you know, particularly in lines of dialogue, you go, oh, man, I didn't think of that line of dialogue. I'm repeating it from something I saw on TV or read in a novel or saw in a movie years ago. And I'm unconsciously doing that. And I've got to change it. So all these things you, you have to be very careful of and you have to be cognizant all the time. Now, um, this is why people say, you watching that Jack Reacher show? You'd love that Jack Reacher show. I've, I'm not watching that Jack Reacher show, and I've never read a, a, a novel of Jack Reacher because I'm writing my own series of vigilante loner novels, and I don't want this series to rub off on me. I don't want to be exposed to it uh, to make sure that I don't unconsciously copy anything. Uh, so, you know, so when I'm working too closely in the same genre over an extended period of time, I tend to avoid any material that might even tangentially relate to what I'm writing. And since I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to write my 12th Levon Cade novel, I'm rather invested in my own series. And it's way, it, it, there's, I, I can't foresee a time when I'm ever going to watch Jack Reacher. So sorry, I, I, I hear it's good, but I'm going to have to pass my friends. Now, a very specific example of not copying, this is kind of a weird one, is, uh, for years and years and years, I had this idea. I mean, I mean, this is like since the 70s, this idea of writing a Western novel in which the conflict wasn't over gold or water rights or cattle or cowboys versus Indians or any of that stuff. It was over uh, 
it was between paleontologists searching for dinosaur bones in the American West. And if you've ever read about Drinker and Cope, the two big paleontologists of the mid-1800s, uh, they literally did this. They went out West and they had to hire, you know, gunslingers uh, to protect their digs. Uh, they would they would dynamite their digs closed to prevent one another because these bones were worth a fortune because dinosaurs were a rage in the mid-1800s. And um, you can make a fortune basically treating dinosaur bones like a circus act, like a Barnman Bailey kind of thing. Plus, both of these guys wanted to make their, their name, <laughs> make their bones, haha, in the field, you know, the, the growing field of paleontology. Uh, so I wanted to write a Western, you know, an action tough guy Western based on that period. And I thought about it for years and I made notes and did research and blah, but I never got around to it. And then I heard, I read an article where after Michael Crichton died, Michael Crichton, creator of Jurassic Park, Andromeda Strain, uh, many, many other properties, um, Michael Crichton, it, it, upon his passing, they were going through his files and they found a, a large part of a novel written with an outline to complete it. And I guess they hired somebody to ghost the completion of it. It's called Dragon Teeth. And uh, it was going to be published. And it was about paleontologists in the Old West. Well, now the clock was ticking because there was a book coming out. So I had to write, if I was ever going to write my paleontology western I, I had to do it now and of course never you know i would never read Crichton's book and i wanted to have my book completed i wanted proof that my book was completed before the publication of michael Crichton's book and so i just i just got on it and i just spent like three months uh doing nothing but writing la gringa which is uh, to date my longest novel uh, most intense novel. It's it's book two in the Sidewinder series of westerns, and um, you can get it at Amazon Books. And it is a uh, rough and tumble, very mean spirited <laughs> uh, western about searching for dinosaur bones in the old west. So, so there's a very conscious example to make sure I wasn't copying another person's work because they were plow in the same field. Uh, an, another example is on a series that I'm doing some work on, uh, Midnight's War. It, it, it said Arctoons. Uh, it's uh, created by Vox Day. It's set in a universe where vampires basically rule the world. They are the dominant species on the planet, and they coexist with humans. Um, and it's a really, really fantastic universe. It's a terrific world to play in. And my corner of it is this uh, human police um, officer who uh, basically works as a thrall to the vampires, a very resistant um, thrall, a very insubordinate thrall. Uh, but their they're, they're cop drama is set in this weird, weird you know, world where um, the people that rule the world go to sleep all day. It's, it's, it's just a really interesting place to work. And um, so in, in this first series that appears on Arctoons, the majority of it's written by Vox, but whenever we cut away to the police procedural mystery scenes, those scenes are mine. And, I, you know, I created those characters. And, um, you know, Vox goes through and rewrites to make sure everything's consistent because it's his world. I'm only playing in it. And uh, there was a time recently when he was, he said, well, I think you've repeated a scene here unintentionally. And I went back and reread everything, and I was like, no, I, I didn't repeat that scene. It was a scene about my lead character, Kyle Bruckner, and how he's human and needs he needs sleep himself. But the vampires seem to take advantage of him. They seem to want him to work night and day. Uh, they don't care. He can sleep anytime. They have to sleep during the day. He can sleep anytime, so they take advantage of this. And then the, and the poor guy is working, you know, 48 hours, 72 hours straight. And I did two different scenes, um, you know, basically bringing this forward with, you know, this idea that they are not letting him sleep. Uh, they keep giving him, you know, uh, daytime assignments as well as nighttime assignments. And um, 
I wanted both those scenes, but but Vox was right. I I sort of repeated some of the same things. Uh, some some of the dialogue was too similar in both scenes, so I rewrote the second scene. So it brings forth the idea again because you you, you want to. I, I think it's an interesting uh, facet to the story, to the conceit of this vampire universe um, that humans don't get to sleep as much when they work for the vampires as the vampires get to sleep. Uh, so. But I rewrote the, the 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 second scene where this appears. So so yes, I probably did unintentionally write the same scene twice. But I wanted to keep hitting that note on the stories. So I mean, there's a you know perfect, very specific example. Hey, if you want to read Midnight's War and dozens of other uh, terrific comic book series that are updated weekly, you can go to Arc Haven Arc Tunes. Uh, I'll put the link down in comments. And uh, it's a free digital comic service with just tons of material. Uh, Gary Quapis and my uh, Right Ho Jeeves, our adaption of Right Ho Jeeves, is now concluded. You can read it in its entirety for free at Arctoons, along with My Sister Suprema and Something Big and all the other series that I'm writing there. All right. Daniel Harden. I am not familiar with Tales of Terror, and this is the first issue I picked up. I see you have a story in the issue. Did you contribute to other issues of Tales of Terror for Eclipse? If so, do you have a favorite you can remember? I just skimmed through Total Eclipse 2, and I see it as a crossover with lots of Eclipse titles, several of which you were the writer for the main titles, Airboy, Valkyrie, Skywolf, and Strike. I know you've mentioned that you enjoy crossover stories. Was this your first crossover story you worked on? I see you're listed as a consulting editor for the book. What contributions did you get to provide to the story as a consulting editor? Okay, well, this is the issue of Tales of Terror that you bought. And yes, I did indeed uh, have a story in here. And I contributed quite a bit to Tales of Terror. Tales of Terror was my intro to Eclipse Comics. My very first story sold to, um, to Eclipse was for Tales of Terror. And it was uh, Cat Ironwood editor. And I... Pitched a few ideas. Uh, well, actually, I, I didn't pitch. I just wrote scripts and sent them in because, you know, they're eight pagers. And, it, you know, it's hard to pitch an eight-page story. Uh, you, you kind of feel like you're telling a shaggy dog story. Um, and, and I wanted to, I wanted, you know, when you're telling verbally a surprise-ending story, you can mess it up. So I wanted to write the full script because all of these were EC-influenced, EC Comics-influenced EC stories with twist endings. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to make sure she read a script that perfectly set up the ending. And the first one I wrote is pretty much my favorite of all I did for Tales of Terror. It was called Chop Shop. It was about a um, uh, car theft ring and, and the guy that they would bring the cars to. And uh, it's um, it, and I got to work with Bob Harden. It was my first time working with Bob Harden who I had met at the Kubert School. Uh, there was a Kubert School reunion that I got invited to, even though I didn't go to the Kubert School. And Bob and I uh, met for the first time, and Bob was a real a cartoonist. He, he worked for uh, Cartoon Magazine and Hot Rod Toon Magazine, things like that. And, um, you know, just fantastic artist, fantastic cartoonist. And um, he and I worked on Shop Shop together, and I was just so pleased with the end results. And uh, we worked several more times together on Tales of Terror. I was always trying to come up with car-oriented stories for him. Uh, not to typecast him, but I did. And then, of course, you know, years later, we got to work together again on the upcoming Seven Deadly Sinners. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy writing these things. And sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes Kat would call me and say, you know, we're X number of pages short for uh, the next issue. Could you write a two-pager, a three-pager, a four-pager? And I would. I would I would bang them out and and uh, send them over. Uh, and you know some of the some of the most fun I had was that pressure of I gotta come up with a twist ending horror story today that fits into two or three pages. And uh, it's got to be done by the end of the day because uh, Kat needs it. She needs to give it to an artist. We need to get going. Uh, but I appreciated being the go-to guy on these because they knew I would deliver. If I said I could do it, I, I would do it. And uh, I, I've always liked the role of the go-to guy, the guy they think of, oh, hey, we're in a problem, we're in a jam, uh, let's let's ask Chuck. <laughs> so, 
Um, now, as far as Total Eclipse, uh, Total Eclipse was my first crossover, although I, I was only tan tangentially involved with it. Uh, Eclipse wooed Marv Wolfman away from DC uh, to work on this thing. And, um, you know, because he had done this kind of stuff before, obviously, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, Ring a Bell. And uh, they wanted him to basically draw the Eclipse universe together into one, you know, monster five-issue prestige format uh, series. And as far as being a consulting editor, it was really just a matter of, would you read over the smart scripts and make sure that, you know, um, he's gotten the characters right. I mean, every, everybody who was involved in this did the same thing. We reviewed the scripts and I don't, I don't remember ever having a problem. I don't, I don't, I, I doubt I'm, I, I asked for anything more than like minor tweaks to the dialogue uh, because, you know, he nailed it. You know, Marv's a pro. And, um, you know, I, I don't think this did for Eclipse what they wanted it to do. I, I think that they were trying to brand themselves and, you know, uh, just announce to the world that, yes, we have a, a huge, cohesive, shared universe just like DC and Marvel. Uh, I think it sold well enough, but it didn't make the huge impression on the comic book industry that, um, that I think Kat and Dean wished that it would. Uh, but it was a good effort, and I, and, you know, it, it's a cool story, and it's um, it's good crossover stuff if you ever if you ever find it. Hey, the questions are really long this week. <laughs> you have been reading comics for a long time, and you know about comic history. I came upon this tweet, which I think is ignorant, an ignorant tweet, uh, <laughs> but wanted to know what is your opinion on it. Was it misinformed as well? Uh, the tweet states that geek culture and comics are always left wing and that all left wings are heroes and all right wings are villains. But this is not really true. First is everything even left or right. Is there something in between in comics or maybe none at all? It sounds very simplistic. And I just think of Wonder Woman as an example. She used to hate men like modern feminists do. But upon meeting one and going to the world of men, she learns that not all men are bad that evil comes in both sexes, like Cheetah or Cersei, or like Ares and Maxwell. She then ends up falling for a man, Steve Trevor. I've read many comics, but most, if they have a political idea, it's very subtle compared to the modern ones. Yes, yeah, subtle. <laughs> yes, yeah, subtle, unlike a hammer to the forehead. Your example of Wonder Woman is an excellent example, by the way, of... Um, how to address these issues without telling the reader what to think. And also to show the evolution of a character. This is Wonder Woman's arc. Uh, and you've, you've summarized it perfectly, I, I must say. Um, now, yeah, a lot of people go, well, you know, all the old comic book characters created, they were leftists, you know, because they came out of the Great Depression and the country under FDR was being introduced to a lot of leftist ideas. But what people don't remember, people don't know, because we're not taught about the Great Depression um, from an objective point of view, is that um, FDR's attempt to turn um, the United States to the left failed, for the most part. Uh, in a large part, it, it, it didn't fail, but um, FDR saw the last time that government agencies were shut down. Uh, the National Recovery Administration, the Works Project Administration, and the Citizens Conservation Corps were huge efforts during the Depressions to get Americans back to work. But at the heart of them was, was a very fascistic system of checks and balances and bureaucracies and red tapes and government officials and everything else. And as Always, when the government gets involved in something, they made every problem they tried to solve worse. And when Americans saw the rise, well, I don't want to get into too much of this, but when Americans saw the rise of fascism in Europe, um, there was an eerie similarity between the symbolism and message of what Benito Mussolini and, and um, Hitler were pushing to what FDR and the New Deal were pushing even down to eagle symbols and things like that, even down to the, like the trade dress 
for these government agencies looked very, very much like what was going on in the burgeoning Third Reich and uh, Il Duce's Italy. And so the American public rejected this. And the, the, um, the breaking point for these agencies and for the, the, the New Deal was when um, the Works Project Administration went after a group of Jewish butchers in Brooklyn. They were the Schechter brothers, and they had a chicken business. And the chickens were prepared. You would go there and you would buy a, a dressed chicken at their butcher shop. That's all they did was you bought, they sold whole chickens, kosher chickens. And these were chickens, you know, slaughtered and prepared under ancient Hebrew rules, the ancient Hebrew kosher rules, which involve, you know, cleanliness and all kinds of things. Very restrictive rules. It's, a, you know, if you're a kosher butcher, it's, it's strict, much stricter than the rules of the Works Project Administration. But the Works Project Administration, the WPA, would not acknowledge that these Schechter brothers were exceeding the um, parameters of the regulations required of them. And they tried to shut them down. Well, the Schechters went to court, and it went public. And here the United States got to see these hardworking brothers being forced out of business by the government, being bullied by the government. And the American public reacted vociferously against this. They made their um, displeasure at this well known. And the WPA had to back down. And that's when FDR and and, um, his cabinet realized, you know, we may have gone too far here. And they shut down the WPA, the the. National Recovery Administration, and the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, very rapidly. And that was the end of those government agencies. And what is that? I mean, where, where did that politics come from? Where did the publics, were they coming from the right? Were they coming from the left? No. They were coming from a sense of morality, a sense of um, who we are as Americans, a, um, you know, what we'll stand for and what we won't stand for. And that, at the root of it, is populism. Okay? It didn't matter what side of the political spectrum you were on. And back then, people really didn't think about that. You were either a Democrat or you're a Republican. You didn't think about the political spectrum. Um, but it didn't matter what side of that spectrum. It didn't matter what party you voted for. You knew the Schecters were getting a raw deal. They were getting bullied because they were the little guy. And FDR and his gang thought they were going to get away with it, but they didn't. Now, how does this relate to comics? Superman and most of the superheroes, I I would say all of the superheroes this period, they grow out of that sense of populism. It's um, Superman is created by two young guys. two young Jewish guys, and that's important. And they create Superman as an ideal, but he's a populist ideal. He's a hero for the everyman. He's the guy we could all be, um, you know. And in early stories, and this is what the leftists like to point out, in early stories, Superman went after, you know, evil landlords and evil corporations and, you know, uh, things like that. And they think that makes him a left-wing hero. Well, it's not, because uh, who likes an evil landlord? Who likes an evil corporate raider? Uh, Who likes someone who's cheating the public? Who likes a corrupt politician? There's no politics there. That's just immoral. And we're we're all supposed to be disdainful of immorality and unfairness and injustice. And so so when Superman was like, you know— given a hard time to a, a, a landlord who was evicting, you know, widows and orphans, that was something everybody could get behind. That, that wasn't a political thing. And as we see today, you know, battling an evil businessman, well, a lot of your businessmen today are to the left. So I, I don't see how, well, I, I know that it wasn't political. 
Siegel and Schuster were creating a great American hero. And as I've said in videos before, they were creating this as um, a, from a minority point of view. Uh, I don't know Siegel and Schuster's entire history, but I bet anything they were first generation Americans. I all bet that, you know, German was spoken at their home, uh, German and Yiddish. I'm, I'm willing to bet that. And um, they were a minority that wasn't always looked upon favorably. Um, they, but they loved America even when America didn't love them back. And they created Superman, as a lot of these comic book creators created Superman. It is a wish fulfillment figure, a figure of strength and morality and principles. The guy who would come in and, and see that justice was done. And that's why, truth, justice, and the American way. That's what Superman stands for. And there's, he isn't left-wing. He isn't right-wing. He is a populist hero. And that's why, no matter what part of the political spectrum you're coming from, you can relate to Superman. You can project yourself on Superman. And all of the best iconic superhero characters are that way. You can project yourself. You can believe whatever you want to believe about them because they're a paragon. And you can assign them whatever, you know, you can believe that Superman is a Republican or an Independent or that doesn't matter, as long, but it should never be specified, okay? Because it's a shared ideals no matter where you come from politically, you know, unless you're far left, in, in which case you don't really have any ideals, or principles. Same thing for Cap. Um, you know, Captain America, they love pointing out, he, he beat up fascists. So he beat up right-wing people. And they love to, you know, say, well, if Captain America were here, he'd be punching Trump today. Uh, the problem is, is Hitler wasn't a right-winger. Uh, you know, remember what I said, FDR, in the 1920s, um, everybody thought Mussolini, the, the pe people in, in academia and people in politics and people in leadership positions in this country thought Mussolini had all the answers, baby. He was turning Italy around in the twenties. You know, the trains were running on time as the cliche goes, and they thought he was the coolest thing ever. And a lot of academics traveled over there. They traveled over to see what Mussolini was up to. They traveled over there to see what Stalin was up to. And they thought it was all cool. It's all peachy keen because they were only shown, of course, the best parts. They weren't showing all the hungry Italians starving. They weren't showing the famines in the Ukraine. <laughs> they, were, they were on a Disneyland tour of, of far-left ideology, of far-left far left socialism and fascism. And fascism is to the left. I'm sorry to tell you that. Hitler was a national socialist. Um, Right-wing is individualism. Right-wing is leave me alone, stop telling me what to do. The further you get to the left, the more people want to tell you what to do. And so... Cap created as another wish fulfillment figure by another couple of first generation Americans, children of, of immigrants, uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. They created Captain America as a wish fulfillment figure to go after um, a guy and an ideology that was murdering probably relatives of theirs in Europe, you know, rounding up uh, their, their, the family members that were left behind. Uh, and the dangers of Nazism, the dangers of anti-Semitism were clear to see, uh, he, even here in the United States. It was a, it was a um, sort of wave of thought that was, I'm, I'm not going to say it was common, but it was there. Uh, the, this, is a, this is a time when the Ku Klux Klan marched on Washington in the hundreds of thousands, uh, and no one really thought anything about it. Uh, so Simon and Kirby create this character that embodies America's distaste for the far left, as represented in this picture by Adolf Hitler. Uh, I'm sorry if you're on the far left and that offends you, but that's the truth. Uh, Hitler was no kind of right winger. You can call him that all day long, but it simply isn't true. He held no right wing principles. He wanted to destroy the German family. He wanted to destroy the church. Uh, he wanted to destroy all the traditional ways of life in Germany and replace it with the state. And that in no way, shape, 
or form is a right-wing ideal. And so Cap comes along, he represents all of us, and he also represents that we are going to be in this fight, uh, that Americans are going to have to sacrifice and everything else. So he's this wish fulfillment ideal that if we could just have a guy go over there and start punching the hell out of these creeps and, and, and get this settled. And there's nothing political about that. At this point in our history, this was about survival. If the American way was going to survive, we were going to have to defeat this menace. We had no choice in this matter. We were going to have to defeat, defeat the creeping fascism that was going to spread all across the world. Because if, you know, these were desperate days. I, I know they don't teach a lot of World War II in school, but these were desperate days. Captain America appears at a time when Europe is, for the most part, under the Nazi heel. And England is going to be the next to fall. And when it does, it's all over, baby. When England falls, America has no foothold in Europe. They have no friend left in Europe. And so these were desperate times for America and for the world. <clears throat> and Cap embodies the hope for a future and also the the rah-rah spirit. I mean, it's propaganda, but propaganda can be good. The rah rah spirit that we're 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 Americans, baby. We're gonna that we're tough. We're gonna make it through this, okay? And and Cap was part of that. Now this is in contrast to today, where it you know the creators, I use that term loosely, um, <clears throat> have a political agenda and they want to push it and they want to tell you how to think. Nobody in the old comics, nobody until two thousand for the most part was teaching you what to think. They were might present an issue. I did lots of issue comics, but I never told you what to think on any issues. I presented them as, you know, grist for dramatic stories. That's the only reason I presented the issues. I didn't present the issues because I wanted to be, you know, a very special episode of Robin. I presented them because these are great story opportunities. And, and also they're things that people are dealing with. And so you want to be able to relate these, even though these are these fantastical costume and masked characters, you want to be able to relate to them and know that they share the problems of your world, even in their imaginary world. And so, um, you know, I would deal with issues, but, but I'd never insert my politics. And I, because that's not what readers want to read. They, you don't want to be preached at. Well, that's all these comics do now. They either try to preach you or shame you or offend you or whatever, or get you just not in agreement. And those are, you know, the, you know, I mean, they bring out a comic, and if you don't celebrate it and think it's the most wonderful comic ever, you're a racist and a bigot and a homophobe and a transphobe or whatever else other name they want to call you, uh, all of which are meaningless now because of overuse. Uh, it's like the only virtue that their book has is um, as a litmus test for where you stand on the spectrum. And uh, it makes for some really, really crappy comics, as we have all been witness to. Levi Sweeney, I have a question for your podcast. I see a lot of comic books these days which begin with multiple panels on page run one rather than the traditional full page splash followed by either a double page spread or a few pages with three, four, and perhaps five panels. What do you think caused this shift away from the creative sensibility behind the first page splash and what is required for this technique to work well and what elements cause it to work poorly? Um, it's a lack of craft. It's a lack of understanding how a comic book works. It's a disinterest in engaging the reader. Uh, it's just poor writing is what it is. And, I, and I've seen this coming for a long time. Uh, you pick up a comic book and you expect to read about Spider-Man or Daredevil or Batman. And the first page is two characters you've never seen before talking about something trivial. And uh, I don't know if we blame Seinfeld or Quentin Tarantino or whatever, but David Mamet. But these writers think that their dialogue is so freaking fascinating that you'll be drawn into a story um, no matter what they put down. Uh, that, that you'll just bow to their cleverness. Well, if the first page is no good, uh, 
and doesn't draw you in, then the rest of the story probably isn't either. And that was the point of Splash Pages. Splash Pages presented a, a, a shocking imagery, uh, a scene of conflict. Um, maybe they picked up on the cliffhanger left over from the previous issue, or maybe they were cold openings. One of my favorites is an issue of Fantastic Four, which begins with Johnny and Ben chasing a dinosaur around the Baxter building. Uh, and we, we sort of, it's sort of like the beginning of Lethal Weapon 2. It just begins with a chase. We're in the middle of the chase. And um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful because because you learn so much on the, on the following pages. And as you said, yeah, you do the, you know, the tradition was back when I was particularly working in the 90s, do the splash, then the double page spread, and then, you know, larger panel pages uh, and, until you... You've drawn the reader in, then you can go to the smaller panel pages with the quieter moments or exposition or dialogue or character exchanges or whatever. But you've got to grab the reader on this. But that what's the point? I mean, you know, if you're telling someone a story about something that happened to you during the day, don't you begin with something that's engaging? Don't you know, guess what happened to me today? You know, I mean um, I don't really get it. Uh, a perfect example of one that sort of breaks the formula was the very first issue of Nick Fury by, by Jim Stranko. And Stranko was all about breaking the formula, about stretching the limits of what you could do in comics. And, and this was the splash. Who is Scorpio? Uh, and it's Nick Fury climbing up a building, uh, which when I was a kid, was like, whoa, this is awesome. And then it goes on to even more awesomeness with two more pages uh, with eight panel grids with no words. And it's, it's um, pretty much like a James Bond pre-credit sequence kind of thing that, that Jim recreates on a comic book page. And when I was a kid, it was just brilliant. Just br- I still think it's brilliant. And uh, draws you right into the story. I mean, you gotta you gotta read the rest of this because if the rest of is this is half as cool as the beginning, this is going to be the most awesome comic ever, and it is one of the most awesome comics ever. And um, so you know, that's what you do. It's it, and this is what you don't do. This is in comics. This is a two page spread or part of a two page spread. I had to close in on it. This isn't comics. Uh, This is not a balance between words and pictures. The pictures are not carrying the story here. The pictures, look, look, here's Steranko. It's all pictures. (laughs) Okay, it's carrying the story. He never loses you. He makes you move from panel to panel the way he wants you to move. You're moving at the pace he wishes you to move. And he's telling you a story without words. Um, Whoops, I'm jumping ahead. Here we're telling a story... Well, it's entirely with words. How do these pictures relate to this exchange of dialogue? They don't. I mean, maybe somewhere in one of those word balloons, that facial expression matches up. But this is this is lousy comic book writing. And, and as I said, in the end, it's not even comics. And why would you be engaged with this? What where, What is there? I mean, I can only assume this is page two and three of a comic. Why would you keep reading? And what was the splash page like? You know, comics aren't novels. Um, They're not illustrated books. They are a medium combining words and pictures, and there is a balance that must be struck between the two. Words must never overwhelm the pictures. The pictures must never, must complement the words. Uh, And if you're going to get into the argument of who's more important, the artist or the writer, they're both important. They're both equally important. They are, it, it is a duet. They are together. It is a, you know, it's Abbott and Costello. Can't have one without the other. It don't work. So, yeah. Anyway, I rant and rant. Romu, I'm murdering your name here, brother. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, I don't even know if Romu's a guy's name. <laughs> Romu uh, Queros? Queros? Okay. Anyway, you'll correct me. In the comments. <laughs> what do I, but thank you for the question. How do I buy the 150-page edition of Alt Hero Q? No problem if it's a digital version. In fact, I would prefer this way since this, once the shipping to Canada from USA is 
uh, since the shipping to Canada from USA is oddly expensive. It is oddly expensive, isn't it? We share a border, but it costs a freaking fortune to send something to Toronto. And who is Helix Hayes? I found his art amazing, and I've been searching for him in every social media I ask that because I intend to also talk to you about you guys as creators. Um, okay, Alt Hero Q is a series uh, that began as a comic book. It's been running on Arctoons. Uh, it uh, features uh, a uh, former U.S. Treasury agent who becomes involved in a worldwide conspiracy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a right-wing fantasy. It's a right-wing fantasy. What if Q, <laughs> the mysterious, insidious, uh, <laughs> much maligned, QAnon was an actual uh, like trilateral commission or dwarves of Zurich, the way leftists seem to think it is, rather than some anonymous people uh, posting on the web. You know, what if Q was like a real organization and it had an operative? And um, so I created an operative for them and my hero goes around uh, uncovering conspiracies in an oddly prescient way because... Um, as I told Vox, I said, we got to hurry up and finish the series because it's actually becoming true. Uh, it's going to look like I'm copying past events when I was actually predicting future ones because the story climaxes in Ukraine. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that's going on right now in the news and has been going on for months um, is, appears there, even though I finished this about a year and a half ago. Uh, the problem is um, our artist has other commitments, and but he is working on it. He is working on issue six. Issue five is complete. I've seen colors from issue six. It shouldn't be much longer. And the entire six issue miniseries will be uh, appearing in digital, will be um, available in print and all the rest of it. Uh, and I have written the first issue of a series to follow, a miniseries to follow. So this is a lot of fun to write. He's sort of a slob James Bond. And uh, now as far as who is Helix Hayes, Helix Hayes is a pseudonym. Because uh, for some people, working with Fox Day is problematic because uh, he's, yeah, he's got a bit of a reputation. Fox is a bit of a troublemaker. He's, he's been known to have an unpopular opinion or two, <laughs> and some people take offense to that. Me, I don't give a crap. Uh, I've been blacklisted, shitlisted, redlisted. I'm, I'm out of the book. Uh, I've been erased. I'm not in anybody's Rolodex. Nobody's calling me <laughs> from the big two. I've had to make my own way, and I'm fine with that. You know why? Because I'm a right-winger. I'm fine with being a rugged individualist, and I've done well. I've done very well. So uh, anyway, some people are afraid to use their name. I don't blame them because cancel culture, uh, you could lose your job. I, I don't know Helix Hayes' real name. I don't know anything about him. I don't know where he works as a full-time job but I'm really glad he's on this series because he is an awesome talent. And I wish I could tell you who he was, but he, he isn't. And this isn't the first time this has happened. I did a, I did a book recently with a frequent collaborator. He says, ah, I'm afraid to put my name on this. I don't, I, you know, I might lose other work that I'm doing. And I said, well, just come up with a name like Lance Strong. And he says, well, that's it. Lance Strong. <laughs> so he did the book as Lance Strong. <laughs> but these are the things we have to do because uh, we're living in a, in, in pretty scary times, my friends. Uh, where you uh, can be uh, canceled, blacklisted, audited, <laughs> investigated, <laughs> if you hold opinions uh, that don't match uh, the conforming ones that are recognized and approved by uh, our alien masters. Now, if you want to read um, uh, Alt Hero Q uh, up to this point, you can go to Arctoons and read it for free. It's there in high-res digital format. And uh, I promise you, it is being completed. And um, Helix will not be working on the next series, unfortunately. We're going to get somebody who can, you know, do the next series in a more timely fashion. And uh, just as a, a, a teaser, the next series deals with um, a, a, another pandemic, a second pandemic, the one that Joe Biden keeps telling us is coming. Uh, <laughs> oh, Creeper Weirdo. Welcome back, Creeper. So recently, I saw The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable for the first time. I was wondering what you thought of Shyamalan. I've been disappointed with his recent work, but his old stuff is still great. When do you think he went bad, or was he ever over? Was he was he always overrated? Well, I, I talked about M Night Shyamalan recently, and how I'm absolutely convinced he stole the ending of Signs from my series Invasion Fifty Five because he's a big comics fan. And there's no freaking way he missed it. 
uh, you know, but, you know, it's Hollywood and they can't admit they stole from you. Otherwise, they might have to give you some money. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't I, I can't have that, you know, have them send me a, a tear stained uh, pile of cash that they really don't want to give me. Those poor guys. Uh, so, uh, and my I, I think he's extraordinarily talented. I don't think he's overrated at all. I, the problem is he's gotten himself into a trap. Uh, he had incredible success with the Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense was a big production from Touchstone, but it wasn't didn't cost a lot of money to make. Uh, and then was surprisingly successful at the box office. And this movie was in release, in release, initial release for like six months, which is unheard of, uh, especially now. There's no movies last beyond three weeks today. Uh, and it just kept making money, just kept bringing that cashola in. And overnight, Shyamalan is, uh, you know, a big deal. And they want more stuff from him. And uh, he comes up, he goes, you know, he, he, he delves into his love of comics and he comes up with Unbreakable. But the thing is with The Sixth Sense, the, the biggest gimmick on The Sixth Sense was the surprise ending, the ending you didn't see coming. And it's very well done. Uh, it's very well set up. It's very subtle. Uh, the movie is actually even more entertaining on a second viewing as you see how he set it up, how there's no hole in the logic for the film and, and how subtly uh, he constructed this, um, you know, O. Henry Twilight Zone type ending. Uh, so he does Unbreakable and I don't, I don't know what his original ideas for Unbreakable were, but I'll bet you anything the studio said, hey, how about another one of them Shaco endings? So he has to come up with the Mr. Glass thing, uh, which is a cool ending, but it's not really that shocking. Uh, it's a lot more subtle. It's not a slam bang. Oh my God, I didn't see that coming. It's just sort of like, uh, okay, this clarifies what Samuel L. Jackson's all about, you know, completes his arc. So not that big a deal. So for his next film, the studio's like, yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, we got to get that shock ending. We got to get that surprise we didn't see coming. <laughs> so uh, Shyamalan comes up with Signs, an alien invasion film. And I really love this movie. I really, for all of its flaws, except for that marvelous ending that he stole from me, um, for all of its flaws, I love this movie. At the heart of it, it makes no sense. And this is where it begins, Shyamalan begins to run into trouble. Even though this is a marvelous film, and I've watched it many, many times, and performances, everything else, it's just a flawless thriller. At the heart of it, it makes no sense. It's about an alien invasion, this is a global alien invasion. Aliens appear all over the planet, and they're gonna, you know, they're coming to get us. And uh, and they're, they, you know, they're evil, they're nasty, they're malignant, and the Earth, planet Earth is doomed. The human race is doomed. Uh, now, the surprise ending, spoiler alert, is that water is toxic to these aliens. It acts like sulfuric acid on them. They can't stand water. Well, then why would they invade a planet? that's three quarters covered with water where it rains all the time. Now this film takes place over the course of a couple of weeks. And are we to believe that it never rained, snowed, sleeted, drizzled in that entire time that these aliens were never once ever exposed to any water for two weeks on the entire planet. And that's where it kind of falls apart. Uh, my own miniseries, Invasion 55, in which we find out that the aliens are very, very much adverse to water. It, it's deadly to them. Uh, I, I set it during a drought in New Mexico. <laughs> uh, so the aliens only land in one place, and it's a place they are damn sure it ain't going to rain. They're not going to be exposed to any open water or any falling water. But anyway, this is where the wheels begin to come off, but also Shyamalan shows us that he's more versatile than we saw him before because this there's a lot of really funny scenes in this movie. So we've seen that he can handle comedy very well. So signs, signs is a sign that Shyamalan is a more well-rounded director than his two previous, you know, much more dour films would lead us to believe. And then we get to the village, and this is where the wheels come all the way off. Uh, I, I, I'm a, I know I'm a writer, and I think a story all the time, and all the rest of it. But when I go to a movie, or I watch a movie, or I watch a TV show, I suspend all disbelief. Right? I just go in, and I, I want to believe whatever the creators 
are bringing about. I'm not nitpicking. I'm just just soaking it all in. Okay, I'm just standing in front of the fire hose of their creativity, and it's like, wash me down. <laughs> Take me to the river. Just entertain me, and let, just do what you're going to do. And I'm with you all the way. I want to be entertained. I want this to be a great experience and everything else. But So I'm not like trying to guess what's going to happen next or anything else. But, man, if you didn't know 10 minutes into this movie what the quote-unquote shock ending was going to be, uh, you, you must have fallen asleep face down in your popcorn. And this is where it begins to fall apart. And and every Shyamalan film after this um, fails in the same way. And it, and it and it's because of that. It was probably like a studio edict. I mean, he probably couldn't get a, a movie greenlit unless he had a cool surprise ending, you know, that everybody would be talking about on Monday morning. Uh, and that's a shame. You know, because he's stuck in the Twilight Zone trap. Now, and I know that Shyamalan probably didn't set out to be, you know, the new Rod Serling. But the advantage Rod Serling has, had was his show was on every week. So you always had another chance. <laughs> every week he had another chance to thrill you. And I'm going to tell you, you know, this may, I, I love Twilight Zone. When I was a kid, I was devoted to this show. But um, as an adult, reviewing a lot of them. Um, I'd say there's 10 great Twilight Zone episodes. 10 that are great. And there's maybe another 20 that are really good. And then there's a whole bunch of them that are just pretentious twaddle. <laughs> it's just it's particularly ones written by Rod Serling. I understand he was a TV pioneer and everything else, but man, could this guy... Lay on the pretensions. Uh, you just lay it on with a trowel, and which is a, a damn shame. Uh, but the, but but as I said, the advantage of Twilight Zone was it was on every week. So if you thought this week's one was a stinker, you'd check it out the next week, and and maybe there'd be a winner. And like I said, there's there's you know, ten awesome episodes, twenty really good episodes, and there's a bunch of mediocre episodes, and then there's ones that are just unbearable. Uh, they're, they're, they're preachy and obvious and, and just, you know, sledgehammering you with, with Serling's uh, uh, viewpoint, worldview. I don't, I don't know if it's politics, but worldview. Uh, a lot of episodes of Twilight Zone that just make you feel bad to be a human being. And, and I think that was the trap Shyamalan fell into. It's, it's like Scorsese can't get a movie greenlit unless it's got um, DiCaprio in it. Shyamalan can't get a movie greenlit unless he comes up with some, you know, boffo, uh, I didn't see that coming ending. I, I would love to see Shyamalan on just, just find a movie with a good script, any genre, and just give it to him. And I would have confidence that he would do an awesome job on it. I, I want to see an M. Night Shyamalan romantic comedy. I think he would be killer on something like that. He's got all of the instincts. Uh, he obviously works well with actors. I mean, uh, you know, he always gets tremendous performances. He's got a great eye for screen composition and obviously story structure. These surprise ending things, even when they fail, are not easy to write. So, yeah, I think he's a great talent. Uh, and I hold no resentment for him stealing the ending of my comic book. Okay, Aurora Rose. Do you plan on making a Birds of Prey omnibus? I'd love to read your Birds of Prey series, but I don't know where to start. Uh, well, you, it's not up to me when they make omnibuses. If it were, boy, I, they'd have a lot of omnibuses by me because I did a lot of work in DC. Uh, the bulk of my career, basically, the, if you go just by quantity, it, it, it's DC product. And, uh, I would love to see an omnibus of, you know, my, my entire run would fit into an omnibus. Uh, quite handily. <laughs> and the royalty checks wouldn't be bad either. But where you want to start is Black Canary and Oracle, Birds of Prey, number one, by me and Gary Frank. This is the first one shot that we did. We did a series of one shots before we did the monthly book. And this is the beginning. This is the origin. This is when uh, Oracle contacts uh, Dinah and enlists her to uh, be a partner, a, a with Oracle as a silent partner 
in a crime-fighting enterprise, that basically Black Canary would be the enforcement arm for Oracle as she uncovers dastardly plots the world over. And um, so the uh, so this is this is where you would want to begin. This was the brainchild of Gordon uh, Jordan Gorfinkel. Uh, Gorf created the Birds of Prey and, and pestered me to write it and wouldn't let up and wouldn't assign it to another writer because he really wanted me to do it. And eventually I gave in, and this was the first effort that I wrote. Uh, I didn't see what he was talking about. I didn't, I didn't see where these two characters would have a built-in chemistry all set to go. And then when I started writing it, I realized, hey, Gorf was right. These characters belong together. These characters are a perfect mix. And, you know, they continue to be a perfect mix for a lot, a lot of issues uh, written by me and written by others. So, uh, yeah, that's where you want to start. And uh, thanks for wanting an omnibus. I certainly want one, too. Maybe uh, maybe write to DC Comics for all the good that'll do you. <laughs> but I don't see why there isn't one. Two successful movies um, and there's no omnibus doesn't make sense to me. Well, it does. But, but the DO's gone, so why not do it? Hey, I got a uh, question here from Lee Markowitz. <laughs> and, and you're going to get the straight, straight skinny on this one for the first time, friends. Uh, too many years have passed, and I, I'm going to just open up on this subject. Okay, Lee Markowitz says, I was recently listening to a podcast where a news story from Wizard, the Guide to Comics, 19, 61, 1996 was mentioned. The news story reported that Jeff Loeb had replaced you as writer on Captain America on the Rob Liefeld Heroes Reborn Run. Rob Liefeld was quoted, Chuck handed in the first pages and we were very disappointed with the direction that his script took. What were your plans for Captain America and what was it like working with Rob Liefeld, even if very briefly? Well, I mean, I love Cap. I loved Cap when I was a kid. I was so glad when they brought him back and all the rest of it. And I think we all have a certain image of Cap and we all love Cap. And Cap is a great character, as I detailed earlier in the video, how he's a wish fulfillment embodiment of everything that's positive and wonderful and gutsy about America. Uh, he's the best of us. And um, so along comes Li Liefeld, <laughs> Rob Liefeld, uh, and image, basically what happened was image sales are declining, Marvel sales are declining. This is, this is late 90s. And so they decided to combine their declining uh, sales and have the image guys come back to Marvel and do reboots, total reboots of, of classic Marvel characters. I can't even remember who all they did. I, they, they did Cap, they did Iron Man. I, I can't remember who else they did. And, uh, I did, and trust me, I can't remember them because they're forgettable. Uh, so uh, they assigned Captain America to Liefeld. Now, I had been doing some work for Liefeld on his book Profit, and I did some work for, for at Wildstorm. So I had, you know, the image guys had hired me to do a few things here and there. Uh, so Liefeld reaches out. He really wants me to write Cap. And I'm like, cool. But, but, but Rob, this is when I had him on the phone. I never talked to him again after that. I said, Rob, um, you, you got it. You got to do reference. I'm going to send you reference. I'm going to send you every because I want to set part of this story in World War II, part of the story in the present. And basically, we were retelling the origin of Cap from the beginning with, with some a lot of significant changes, but keeping the core of it. To my mind, we had to keep the core of it, uh, of the man you know, reborn in a different century, all that stuff. But I said, you know, I want to do, I want to split the story between World War II and present day. I want to tell the story of Cap. I want to tell the story of Bucky. I want to tell the story of Red Skull. And, and basically show us who these characters are uh, in a new light that doesn't contrast with the old one. I said, but to do that, to do the World War II stuff and everything else, you're going to have to draw accurate reference. Uh, you're going to have to draw accurate tanks and airplanes and things like that. Something I wasn't, at the time, highly confident Rob would do unless I insisted. And turns out, even with my insistence, he wouldn't do it. So I said, I will provide you with everything you need, I will provide you with the turnarounds. If I ask for something in the story, if I ask for a gun, an airplane, a ship, I will give you full reference that you can use. I mean, just trace it. 
you know, but I, but there's no sense in doing a story like this if it's not going to be accurate, period accurate. And I knew that Rob could draw, I, you know, early in his career. He, he did actually draw well and tell a story well. So I thought, well, you know, let's work together to make this really special so that I'm happy and you're happy. And so he agrees. And he offers me this crazy page rate, okay, because his image was paying the bills. So he gives me this crazy page rate. I mean, it was going to make a big, significant difference in my income that year. And the highest page rate I've ever been offered. And I thought, okay, cool. Let me write you the pitch for the six-issue mini, the, the outline. So I write a rather detailed outline. I hate writing outlines. But I got into writing this outline. And in the story, uh, you know, we meet Cap in World War II. He's already a hero. He's already actually fighting with, he's fighting in Europe, you know, fighting the Nazis right alongside our troops. And I think I had Sergeant Fury. I think there were Sergeant Fury references and things like that. Uh, but he runs into a young African American driver for the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball Express was the uh, a unit that was mostly con- comprised of African American soldiers, and they drove trucks. And it was dangerous. I've, I've met Red Ball Express veterans. It was dangerous work driving trucks. Um, to the four frontline troops. So they were the supply chain. And, uh, you know, a lot of them got killed, you know, strafed by the Nazis, uh, landmines, you know, running into Nazi troops and everything else. So Bucky is a driver for the Red Wall Express. And he and Cap develop a friendship uh, at the Battle of the Bulge at Bastogne. And things go on, and they're separated, and they stay in contact somewhat, but then Cap, you know, is frozen in time. I can't remember how. And he ends up um, being, you know, thawed out present day. And part of the story, and, and to me, I mean, my part of the story, it was a big emotional catharsis in the story was he, he looks for Bucky Barnes. And he finds him, Bucky is, a, is an elderly you know, black man at this point, living in, you know, I think Baltimore, someplace like that. And uh, they, they have a reunion and it's very touching and sad, but inspiring at the same time. And, and Cap assures himself that Bucky had a, a happy life. Uh, you know, he, he, he was a successful businessman, raised children, all this other stuff. So, and then, and then of course there's lots of action and, and Red Skull is still alive and, I think I dealt with some version of the sleeper story from the 60s. I, I can't remember the details of it. So I, I hand this thing in. It's like a 20-page outline for a six-issue mini, and I'm really happy with it. And so I said, look, you know, here's the outline. I send it in, and um, let me know. Read it over. Let me know if you have any changes, and uh, let me know when to start scripting. You know, give me deadlines. Now, I'm busy at this point. This is 1996. So I'm working a lot at DC. I'm still doing Punisher. I mean, I'm I'm cranking out, you know, sometimes two comic scripts a week and having a ball doing it. So I just sort of like leave it up to Rob to tell me, you know, send me a schedule. Well, I never get a schedule. So after a couple of weeks, I'm calling. Of course, I never talked to him again. I talked to one of his underlings. And this poor guy uh, has to keep putting me off, you know. Well, you know, no, don't go to script yet. Don't go, no, don't go to script. No, we're fine. Don't go to script. Uh, we don't need it yet. Blah 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 blah. So about a month goes by, and uh, my fax machine rings. Now, now for you kids out there, a fax machine is a, like a telephone that you can send pictures through. Uh, so faxes start coming out. Facts at their facts at their facts at their facts. They're coming out. This long ribbon of, you know, a half mile of facts has come out. And it's penciled pages for Captain America number one. I never wrote a script. Rob is working off my outline, which he promised he wouldn't do. Uh, because I said, I got to write full script. I want to write full script because I want to provide you with all the reference. And I had got all the reference assembled. Xeroxed so I could mail him this big. In fact, I think I did mail him a big, big FedEx package of Xeroxes, airplanes, tanks, guns, uniforms, helmets, blah, 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 everything he would need. 
with with my promise that I give to every artist is, and if you need anything else, just let me know. I have visual reference on everything that I ask you to draw, particularly from World War II. Got shells of this crap. So these pages come out, and they are awful. Just awful. He draws airplanes that made up out of his head that I swear to God, I drew better airplanes on loose leaf paper when I was in the sixth grade, and I was supposed to be paying attention in math class. I am serious. This stuff is awful. And then there's a lot of stuff I don't recognize. Stuff he just added, stuff he subtracted. This is not the story that I wrote at all. So I'm not happy. <laughs> so when the faxes get finished coming through, I look at them all, I ball them up, I throw them in the trash, and I call. And of course I get his underling again. I said, look, Rob was supposed to, he wasn't supposed to work for my outline. He's supposed to work for full script. He told me that I would be full scripting this. And you guys never gave me a schedule. I never got the right full script. And this guy says, well, Rob decided that your, your outline was fine. He could work from that. And I said, no, it's not fine because what he drew isn't really what I wrote. It isn't what I intended. And I'm not happy. And the guy says, well, what can we do? And I said, there's nothing you can do. I said, I am quitting this book. I am no longer the writer. I don't want my name on it. I don't even want to see a copy when it comes out. Now, they put my name on it anyway, even though I specifically said no. And, I, and, the, and the thing is, after I said this, the guy says, well, what are you saying? I said, I said, I'm saying what I'm saying. This is not a negotiation. This is not some sort of a bargaining uh, ploy. Uh, I don't want to be paid for I was never paid for it. I said, I don't want anything to do with this project because it's crap. It's junk. I don't want I don't want to be associated with it. And he's like, oh, you know, well, you know, I'll tell Rob. <laughs> and I said, now, I said, when you tell Rob, tell him, um, we'll just say, because my name had been announced as part of it, we'll just say we had creative differences or I had scheduling conflicts or something. I said, I'm not going to say anything because I, you know, nobody cares what I have to say. I'm not going to make an official pronouncement as to why there's a talent change here. I said, but you're going to want to. Uh, so, you know, go on ahead and say what, you know, just, just say something. Make some excuse why I'm not working on it. But, but I'm not going to say anything. And, you know, gentleman's agreement. Well, the problem with gentleman's agreement is you need two gentlemen to agree. And so the issue of wizard you're talking about comes out and says that my work was, was, was shit. And that was never the case. That I was not fired. I quit. Now, Rob could have easily said all the things that I suggested. Creative differences, scheduling conflict, you know, whatever. And just left it at that. But no, he had to diss me. You know, he had to, you know, jump on me. You know, he, I mean, he got another writer. He got somebody that was willing to put their name on, you know, that steaming pile. Uh, but it wasn't going to be me. It never was going to be me. And um, so, you know, that's it. You know, I the what you read in Wizard was a lie. And I'm telling you what really happened. And um, I pretty much kept silent on this all these years because even though uh, I didn't get a, an amen from the other side, uh, I kept my word and didn't reveal the reasons why I did it. But, you know, if you look at the book, you can see. I'm <laughs> you, if you look at this book, you can see my visceral reaction to those pictures coming over the fax machine. Of just dreck, just the worst comics imaginable. And here, it it made me sad and made me mad at the same time because here you 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 know, Rob was handed a golden opportunity to redeem himself because you know he was being pretty much maligned by a lot of comic fans for being you know uh, lazy uh, and opportunistic. And here he had a chance, golden opportunity, with a book that probably would have sold huge, uh, to redeem himself and and basically do his best work. And he didn't. For my money, he did some of the worst work of his career on this. He just crapped it out, phoned it in. 
And uh, so anyway, there you go. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot in the comments section about this, uh, pro and con. But that's my side of it. Hey, if you have any more controversies that you want to throw <laughs> against me for me to uh, share my outrage, uh, you can contact me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most direct way to reach me. I think all of today's questions were found there, and uh, I welcome more. Please send in more. If you need clarification of anything, contact me here. Suggestions, pictures of your doggies and kitties are always welcome. And uh, that's pretty much it for me this week, except uh, as the ad says, if you like Jack Reacher, you'll love Levon Cade. So uh, why not pick up a Levon Cade novel, starting with Levon's Trade? They're on Kindle, they're in paperback, and they're on audio. And uh, as I said before, I've written 11 of these. I'm getting ready to work, start the 12th one in the next couple of weeks. Looking forward to that. And um, anyway, I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for the questions. Subscribing, super thanks, whatever other way that you showed your appreciation. And I will see every single one of you, I hope, down the road.